Where is Tan Tan? Where is Tan Tan? There's Tan Tan. Good morning. Look at you all. Aren't you just awesome? If my dad Ed would let me buy a pet turtle, I would name it after you. But he won't, so I can't. Well, today's kids take over church. Can I hear an oh yeah? Oh yeah. That was all right, but I think we can do better. So let's try that again. Today as kids take over church, can I hear an oh yeah? Oh yeah! That was better. <laughs> now let's keep that energy going as you show us, us kids how much you love us through the service. Let's pray to kick off the service. Dear God, Thank you for your love and thank you for sending Jesus to love us. Thank you for our church and thank you for all our kids. Please help us learn more about you and how we can share you more with others. In Jesus' name, amen. Hi, my name is Emma T and I am in grade 10. I love coming to Kids Club and seeing my friends and learning about Jesus. Will you join me in singing the love of the Father? I don't know this song, so will you help me by singing really loud? Thank you. Please stand with us while we sing, because she told us to.
says Tyson, there are some things in the world that are um, dark and scary. <laughs> I am so thankful that Jesus is with us when they're help, uh, helping us at troubled times. Will you sing with us, My Lighthouse? My darling. You can't be seated. <clears throat> Good morning, my name is Amelia. It is so nice to join with you in this kids takeover service. Today I get to share with you our announcements. Next week is Father's Day and this Saturday is Father's Day breakfast at 8 a.m. In the, out in the hall. <clears throat> you can buy tickets by going on the events link on our church website. Us kids think our dad's the bee's knee. Dad, I don't even know what that means. <sighs> anyway, so mums, we, we want to help us celebrate the dads or, the, or who, the dads, who do the dad roles in, in our lives by buying their tickets to Father's Day Brecky, and we'll do the rest from there. The, can, the Cancer Council Biggest Morning Tea will be held here on Tuesday at 9.30 a.m. There is still time to get your tickets, so please see Mrs. Robbie if you haven't already. I think this morning tea is really important, so important that I suggested that I have a day of school so I could go, but Mum said no, so she'll have to go on without me. Now Mrs. Robbie needs some help get in getting the table out of the canter 
and into the hall after the service today. Could some big strong men help this lady out, please? In the bulletin, you will find the names of the people nominated for the elders and stewards. Please be praying for God's guidance as we seek God's people in these roles. On the 11th of September at 11.20 a.m., we ask that all the members of the church to be here for a special members meeting, followed by our church AGM. These meetings will will have some important items to discuss, including the financing of our vision and and freezing of the budget and the election of our key leaders. I'll be there, but probably at the back with earphones on watching a funny movie, which won't be as much fun as uh, as the meeting for sure. One final thing for the announcements is that members, you will find a members form in your pigeonhole for the application of membership for Mrs. Mary Davis and Mrs. Robin Carroll. Please complete this form and put it in the voting box no later than next Sunday. Now it is time to worship God through our offerings. Mum and Dad make us do jobs at home and they pay us every fortnight. We each have three jars that we put our money in. First is our spend jar, which we get to spend money on kinder surprises and lollies. The second jar is we where we, is our save jar, which where we get to save up something special. And the third jar is our give jar, where we get to use this money to, to, to give to things that are important to us or people who are in need. Piper and I have these little envelopes. We put some of our give money in in them for back, offering back to God for all the work of the church. At, at the beginning, I did this because Dad told me to, but now I love saying thank you to God for all he has given me, and I love giving to God my offering and providing for the church so we can, so we can keep, keep doing all the great things like providing yummy biscuits for us, for us, kids to eat at morning tea and I hope you do too. As the offering is being taken up, Tyson, Miss Charmaine and Miss Emma are going to play a song for us. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for all the offering that people give. Bless it Lord and let us be a blessing to others as we use it for your glory. In Jesus name we pray. Amen.
Hi, my name is Destiny and I love coming to Kids Club. Will you join us as we sing Jesus from in kind? Kids Club and Kids Church, we have been learning a new song that we'd like to share with you now. It's called King of Me. And then after this song, we would love for you to join us with a song called Fruit of the Spirit. This is a fast song with lots of actions, and it will be fun if you try to do the actions with us. Stand in his way 
He said, hand me my sling, cause he's not that tall. My God is bigger and I watch him fall. My God's the king of the giants. My God's the king of the lions. My God's the king of the creatures of the deep. My God's the king of me. Have you heard the one about this guy called Dan? Yes, he was a mighty holy praying man. He said, throw him to the den of the scary beast. But God saved the hero from the lion's teeth. Yeah. My God's the king of the giants. My God's the king of the lions. My God's the king of the creatures of the deep. My God's the king of me. I've asked us to pause it because you can't do the actions by sitting down. So you'll need to stand up so that you can do the actions with the kids. Now, you need to, everybody, do a little bit of a shake, get yourself organised because these actions are pretty quick. Now, kids, can you show the actions for what it is when we talk about the fruit of the Spirit? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, self-control. All right, so you got that? Great. All right, All right let's, let's hit it, DJ. The fruit of the spirit is not a coconut. Fruit of the spirit is not a coconut. If you want to be a coconut, you might as well hear it. You can't be a fruit of the spirit because the fruit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self control Not a banana. The fruit of the spirit is not a banana. You wanna be a banana? You might as well hear it. You can't be a fruit of the spirit, cause the fruit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, and gentleness, and self-control. Oh, the fruit of the spirit is not a watermelon. The fruit of the spirit is not a watermelon. You wanna be a watermelon? You might as well. Gentleness and self-control Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness And gentleness and self-control Oh, the fruit of the spirit is not a lemon The fruit of the spirit is not a lemon If you want to be a lemon, you might as well hear it You can't be a fruit of the spirit Because the fruit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness And gentleness and self-control Not a cherry. If you want to be a cherry, you might as well hear it. You can't be a fruit of the spirit, because the fruit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, and gentleness, and self control. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, and gentleness, and self control. Oh. Okay. Everybody knows that grapes come in bunches, so everybody get in big bunches. The fruit of the spirit is not a grape. The fruit of the spirit is not a grape.
got it up here, darling. Watch your head. You got to talk. Come on. Hi, my name is Jojo. Will you join us as we sing? As we sing, Lord, I lift your name on high, and will join us, join us doing actions if you know them. Hi, I'm Elliot, and I'm going to read some scripture with you this morning and then pray. To all the saints in Christ Jesus at Philippi, together with the overseers and deacons, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God every time I remember you in all my prayers for all of you. I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. Being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. It is right for me to feel this way about all of you since I have you in my heart for whether I am in chains or defending and confirming the gospel, all of you share in, in God's grace with me. God can testify how I long for all of you with affection of, of Christ Jesus. And this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless until the day of Christ filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Christ Jesus, to the glory and praise of God. Now I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. As a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains 
for Christ. Because of my chains, most of the brothers in the Lord have been encouraged to speak the word of God more courageously and fearlessly. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for how you worked in the life of the Apostle Paul. Thank you that you were able to help him see the good in bad situations and helped him to keep persevering in sharing the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Please help us to see the good in even the hard times and open our eyes to opportunities where we can share you with others. I pray now as Pastor Phil gets up to share the message, open our hearts and minds to hear what you have to say. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Ellen. And thank you, kids. Let's give them another clap for them. Great. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Through there? Great. Thanks, Emily. I love your input as well. Um, as we jump into our PowerPoint as well. So we've been doing a series um, in winning the war in our, our minds. minds. Hands up if you've been enjoying this series so far. Has it been productive in your lives? I hope so. It's, it's been really productive in my life as well, so um, hopefully it's been that way as well. But let me ask you a question. I wonder how many of you are in, tr in the middle of a pretty decent life, for the most part, but still find yourself complaining a lot. Is anybody here game to put their hand up? Oh, oh, oh. Yeah, some kids have put their hand up. Thanks, guys. You're pretty brave uh, for doing that. Our lives can be pretty special most of the time, and our minds can drift to things that we don't like, or to the things that we don't want, and we decide to complain about them. What do we know about our minds? Well, our mind is a battlefield, and most of our lives, uh, most of life's battles are won or lost in the mind. In other words, the life that we have in so many different aspects is a result of the thoughts that we think. What comes into your mind tends to come out in your life. If you have a negative mind, it's almost impossible to have a positive life when your mind is consumed with negative thoughts. Now, the title of today's message is Defeat Your Negative Thoughts. And with that, let's go before God in prayer. Let's pray. Father, we ask that by the power of your word and the presence of your spirit, you would renew our minds with truth. Demolish every stronghold, every argument, every pretension in our minds that sets itself up against the knowledge of truth. Give us the power to grab the negative, hurtful, toxic lies, capture them and replace them with truth. God, give us your mind that we can live according to your will. We pray this in Jesus' name, and all God's people say, Amen. Now, over the last couple of weeks, we've been going through this series, Winning the War in Your Minds, and we've been talking about the power of your mind, and we talked about something that's called neural pathways. It's this understanding that your brain has these pathways of thinking. And, and the more you think about something, the more that this neuropathway becomes clearer. So whatever you're thinking about more regularly becomes easier to think about more and more. And all too often, our brains don't think of positive things or good things, but rather, our brains get caught up in our neural pathways of thinking. Our brain's highway gets consumed with negative and lies and what we have been calling strongholds. And we've been talking about how the presence of the Holy Spirit and how God's Word helps us to renew our minds with truth, demolishing every stronghold every argument, every pretension in our mind that sets itself up against the knowledge of the truth of Jesus Christ that he wants us to have within our lives. Now, I want to expand on this idea today and introduce what, we will, be, what will be a new idea to some of you. I want to talk about what people call cognitive bias. Hands up if you've heard of cognitive bias before. 
Cognitive bias. Well, what is cognitive bias? Well, cognitive bias is the mistake in reasoning based on personal experience or references. That's a very simple uh, definition of cognitive bias. We could call it a mental filter or a mental framework in your life. In other words, if you grow up in a context and had some really bad things happen to you, particularly, say, if you had really bad things happen to you from men um, in your life as you grew up in your family or in the, in the community, as you grow up, you have this cognitive bias towards that men are not safe, that they are not trustworthy, that we can't rely on them and we don't trust them. And hopefully, if that is something that you have struggled with, I pray that God will bring godly men into your life and into situations within your parameters that will be able to show you that there are men who are trustworthy, who are good, and who can be a benefit within your life. Or for another example, you might have grown up with parents who said bad things about wealthy people, like all wealthy people are bad, they're evil, they're whatever. And then you find yourself starting to succeed financially in your own lives, in later in life, and, and you might start feeling guilty or ashamed that you've got this money, and you might start feeling bad about yourself. This filter of understanding of your cognitive bias of rich people or people with money has shaped how you now start seeing yourself. The filters you have shapes how you see life. What is cognitive bias? Well, another one is a cognitive bias is what we might call a default filter. It's when our brain is pre-wired to think in a certain way or it is pre-wired to interpret a situation even if our interpretation isn't completely accurate. This is why two different people can respond so differently to the exact same situation. It's not the, uh, the facts that are different, it's how we filter what is happening. Now, as a leader, I find this quite difficult when it comes to giving people constructive feedback. Growing up in my life, as I've shared with you, I have this sense of insecurity that I'm not good enough. And in my sense of insecurity of not being good enough, when anybody came and gave me constructive feedback, I did not take it well. I took it as them criticising me. I took it as them um, attacking me. I took it as them not trying to help me to improve or, or to grow in myself, but rather showing me why I am not good enough. Now, as a leader, as I come to talk to people, and as people come and say, what did you think about a situation? I've got to battle with this cognitive thinking within my, myself, this cognitive bias of going, if critical, um, critical um, um, critiquing of people is negative, then I don't want to be negative to people. But I've got to go beyond that because as I've grown and as I've become a mature person within my leadership, I wouldn't say a mature person, as I'm growing towards maturity in my leadership, I have come to realise that as people come and love me and want me to grow, they need to give me feedback. Therefore, if I'm a leader that loves those people that I'm leading and those people that I'm leading with, then I need to be able to come and give them wholesome, loving, but good and powerful, constructive feedback. Now, maybe how about you? So we've got this situation, right, where we're in our workplace and we're going to work and on a Monday morning, our boss calls us into his or her office and, and they sit us down and there's, there's one person and then there's ourselves and, and we go into this office and they start telling us feedback. They start telling us about what's going on and how is it happening, how your job is relating to the workforce and giving you critical feedback on what is happening within the workplace and how you are contributing to it. Now, if you're a person who is insecure or somebody who doesn't take um, criticism and feedback well, you would come out of that meeting and go, what on earth did that person think that they were doing? How dare they come and give me that sort of feedback? I don't even like that person. Why do they think they have the right to come and tell me what I should be doing better and what I'm doing wrong? Oh, I'm not going to enjoy today. And yet the person sitting next to you might be in the office and they get exactly the same feedback. 
and they come bouncing out of the office. Oh, my boss is so wonderful. Oh, I'm so grateful that they took the time and effort to be able to share with me their thoughts and how they perceive that I am working with in my workplace. I didn't even realize that I was doing this that was wrong, and I'm so grateful that they pointed that out to me. My life and my workplace is going to be so much better for that critique of my life. Which one are you? If you were in that situation, which one would you be? Now, I've been in that situation, and I can tell you now that sometimes, depending upon what situation I'm in and how I'm feeling, I might be the first one, (laughs) or I might be the second one. Sometimes, my filter changes. How about you? Which one are you? Two different people. Or how about another example? Two people walk into church. Two people together, and one can walk in with the opinion, this church is going to suck. I hate this music. This place is boring. I never want to come back to this church. And right next to that person is another one. This other person comes in with the desire that they're going to love the church. This person comes in with the very same church in the very same situation, and this person is, wow, Aren't these people amazing? Oh, this church is so loving. Oh, the music is wonderful. Maybe I'm here because God wants me to be here. Same situation, people leave with a very different experience. Many times it's because of our cognitive bias. Or also, I'd say, it's because we're going into a situation with our decision made up of what the, what the situation is going to be like. We move into these places with this bias, with a filter in mind. Now, you can see this example within Scripture. In Numbers chapter 13 and chapter 14, our kids in kids club are going through Exodus on the journey of the, the Israelites. Where are they coming out of, kids? Where are they escaped from? Egypt. And where are they going to be going towards? Can you remember? Where did God say, I'm leading you to? The promised land. Now in Numbers chapter 13 and 14, this is the time when they got right next to the promised land and they sent, um, the Israelites sent 12 people out as spies to go and look at the promised land and to work out if it's a good place or a bad place or what do they need to do to prepare to go to the promised land. 12 spies went out and two came back. Two came back with this idea saying, oh, this land, this place, it's, it's wonderful, it's amazing. Wow, this place is so great, it's beautiful. The whole thing is just perfect. God given, has given it to us and let's go now as God has said and we're going to take this land. Two of the spies came back and said that. Now 10, kids, can you put up two? Now kids, can you put up 10? Which one's greater? Ten. That's good. The teachers are teaching them well math at school. (laughs) Now, the funny thing is, if two came back with a positive, what do you think the ten came back with? Emity? Unpositive. Unpositive. That's right. They came back with an unpositive, which, which for some of us might use bad language and call it negative thoughts. They came back with negative thoughts. They came back with this understanding. And and maybe this is something that we need to consider, not in this church for sure, but how easy is it within our society that two people have a positivity, but our society generates negativity? We generate negative thoughts more than we generate positive thoughts. I I know on Facebook, I'm on Begara's Facebook page Ooh, it's full of great things that consume my time of, instead of doing what I really should do. And just the other day, they put up this proposal of a new golf club. Now, as I read through that, I don't know where you fit onto this, but as I read through all the comments, I'm going, wow, this is really exactly what I'm talking about here. Because there was probably 10 negatives to two positives. 
So many negative thoughts within the circumstance. And that's not just one. There were so many other things that I can see in society that there are so many more negative people than there is positive people. Now, that's not our church. Surely not. But society is like that. And you know what Jesus says? Do not conform to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of our minds. And God is calling us not to be like this world, but to be different to the world. To be in the world, but not of the world. And we can see within this passage that 10 came back with this negative, no hope report. This is what they said. This is dangerous. The land devours people, which is really quite funny because as I looked at that passage, the land wasn't devouring people. The people were like giants and we were like grasshoppers in their eyes. Now, now I promise you that nobody went up and interviewed any of these giants and the giants said, well, you're like grasshoppers. Could you imagine giants calling you grasshoppers? Could you imagine being a grasshopper? Yeah? Uh, actually, I thought half of you would probably say yes and half of you say no. I mean, imagination is so, so cool in kids. But these giants, we were like grasshoppers to these giants. Now, the view wasn't different. The land wasn't anything different from the two spies to the ten spies. But what was different? The filter the filter in which they looked at these things. It wasn't the facts that were different. It was what they were seeing and the filter that they used as they were looking at it. Now, here's one funny thing for you, or you might not have found this situation funny, and we're going to play a video in a minute, but there, there was this situation within my life and within Linda and my family's life, and maybe you would remember a similar situation. It was back a long time ago in 2020, And around March 2020, something significant happened in the world. Do you remember what that was? Yeah, you said it in a really COVID, COVID, COVID lockdowns. Now, talking about filters, this is really quite interesting when we perceive this idea. Now, Linda, my amazing wife, she's a pretty amazing introvert. And then she married the complete opposite You know how you've heard about opposites attract? Now, I'm not a pretty amazing introvert. I'm a pretty amazing extrovert. Would you all say that? Or maybe I'd just say I'm an extrovert um, from here. And, And so we went into this situation, and I can tell you now, as we went into these 2020 lockdowns, our perception of these lockdowns were completely different. Linda was like, this is amazing. And I was like... I don't know what to do. I don't get to see anybody. I was trying to make excuses of why I was a critical worker and I should go and visit all the people. And and I was convicted that maybe at this point in time I needed to keep everyone else safe and stay and just make phone calls. But it was horrible. We were looking at two different filters. And in this state of mind, I went into the depths of what I would say is an, an, an element of depression. I was angry really quickly. I was frustrated really quickly. If the girls did anything a little bit wrong, I started yelling at them. They were walking around on eggshells. And Linda saw what was going on, didn't know, like what was going on, and she called for a marriage discussion, called me to our dining table where we had to sit together and we had to hold hands, and she told me all the things that was going wrong, and it was all to do with me. And at that point, I had to listen to what she was saying, and I had to make a decision, a decision to change my filter. And a part of that, we realized that, hang on, this could be a special time for our family. And a part of that, we thought we'd make some fun and have some fun in this time, and hopefully through that fun, we'd make other people laugh. And Ben, can you show this video? And this is one of the things that we did. We decided to make some videos about how opposites can attract. Good day. Go for a walk. 
thank you all for coming here this morning. Before we continue in anything else, I just thought I'd ask, does anybody want a hug? We had so much fun in that situation. Even I, although I couldn't see people, I got to enjoy this moment of, of being able to have fun with my wife and my two girls as well. But it meant that I had to reframe, I had to reframe the way that I looked at my situation, the way that I looked at life. I had to be intentional to see God's goodness and within that situation of what was happening outside of my plan and see how God could use us, even outside of what we wanted to happen. Now, what I want to do right now is I want us to slow down for just a moment and ask and think about our own lives right now. Think even about the expectations that you often have within your mind of a situation. And I'm wondering how many of you wanted something different in your life. Did you want something different and now you're in a different situation? What you wanted was this grand plan and you've been placed in a situation that you would see is not so grand or not in a, such a good situation. Maybe you went to uni and you studied and got a degree and it felt like you were prepared to do something that would be meaningful and now instead of being in a job that you love, you're in an un related job that seemed like it was way beneath your education and you wonder how in the world it was going to be um, and how you got there. Maybe for you it wasn't that you got, that you got to a point in your life where you thought I'd be married and, and I'd be financially out of debt or I'd be able to travel or I'd, I'd have a ministry or be making a difference or I would have started my own business or I'd be leading the business um, that I'm working for or maybe I'd have kids or or, or, or whatever the situation that you're in, you realize that you thought that you would be better off. And you find yourself waking up like, I'm not where I wanted to be. And you're so confused by it. If you ever wake up and think it's that this isn't what I wanted, I wanted the exact opposite of where I am. Well, let me tell you now, the Apostle Paul knows exactly how you would feel. In fact, in his story... In, 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 in Paul's story, he has this incredibly emotional time and this experience within his life where he could have looked at it from two different ways. And, and this is quite emotional and, and quite uh, uh, profound for me as we read the story within Paul's time within the Romans when he was preaching the gospel. Now, if he knew that he could reach the people in Rome, he moved towards Rome and he wanted to preach the gospel the strategic process is that he was going to open up the doors for the gospel to be heard by all those people in Rome. However, as he reached the people in Rome, guess what happened? He got put in prison. So his dream, his bucket list, his top prayer list, his greatest desires, his calling was to go to Rome to preach. And yet when he got there, he was arrested and he was waiting the possibility of being executed. Everything that he wanted, he got exactly the opposite. Paul could have framed the situation in one of different ways. He could have framed it on the negative side. And this is what he could have said in Philippians chapter 1, which our dear Elliot read out before. He could have said from Philippians chapter 1, verse 12 to 13, from the NWPSV version... NWPSV version says, it translates, not what Paul said version. But this is what Paul didn't say. Now, I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me really sucks. As a result of all the hell that I've been through, I'm quitting life group and never going to back to church. Now, that's what he could have said. But what did he say? Now, I want you to know, brothers and sisters, 
that what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. Hmm. How could being in prison, being moved into a situation that was far outside of the realms of what he was expecting, how could he look at it and go, actually, that's serving for, to advance the gospel? As a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. And because of my chains, most of the brothers and sisters have become confident in the Lord and dare all the more to proclaim the gospel without fear. Now, let me share this particular situation. Paul gets thrown into prison. He didn't get to go out into the community and share the gospel with all the community around him where people could have been walking by and choosing to stop and to listen to him if they wanted to. No, he didn't get to do that. He could have been sitting in, in jail in his seat with chains shackled between because what happened in that prison time quite often was so that the person couldn't escape. They had two soldiers either side chained to him. They had to sit there for eight hours. If he had to get up and go to the toilet, they had to stand up and walk with him. They had to go everywhere that he went. They couldn't go anywhere else. They were stuck with Paul. And he could have sat there looking at them and going, oh, God, I don't like this situation. I didn't get to do what I wanted. How could this be happening to me? My plan was what I thought you wanted, God. But that's not what he did. What did he do? He got in there, into this prison. He had two guards next to him. Every eight hours they changed. And his perspective was, these guys can't go anywhere. (laughs) I don't have people I can preach to that walk past and they can choose to stop and listen. But I've got two men on either side that have substantial influence within their community who are now stuck with me. And I can give them an eight-hour long sermon. (laughs) How cool is that? That's a dream of mine, that you guys will sit here for eight hours and listen to my sermons. And he got it. And so Paul is sitting there in prison going, oh, it's not my plan, but God's plan is so good. It's advancing the gospel because so many of these soldiers heard the gospel, they received the good news, and they then received Christ. How do you frame your situations? What are you going through where you're in your space going, God, this is not good. There is nothing good coming from this. Whereas God is saying, just look through my lens. Just see why I've put you there in that situation or in those circumstances because I want to use you in that space. You see, if we're not willing to be reframing our ideas and looking at a different situation, we will never see what God is trying to do in us and through us. Now, kids... I know you're getting a bit bored with me preaching up here, so I've got an activity for you. All right, so I want you to jump up, leaders. I need you to help. Uh, Leaders, I need you to pull these tables forward a little bit. Don't touch the straws. We've got an activity for you to do. Now, it's got to be involving milk. And I apologize if any milk gets spilt on the carpet already. I didn't put any mats down. But they've got some straws. Kids, you can't swap the straws. You've just got to come and stand behind the cups. Mrs. Charmaine, can you come out of way so that the kids can come? You've got to stand behind the cups. And now if you, kids, if you don't have normal milk, but you can have Zimmel, we do have some Zimmel, so make sure you tell the leaders. But you guys have got some straws, right? You guys have got some straws, and you're going to have some milk. What I want you to do is I want you to do an experiment for me. You've got these straws. And I want you to open these straws up. Oh, that's harder than I thought. I want you to open these straws up and put them down next to your cup. We're going to fill your cups up with milk. Now, does anybody know what milk tastes like? It tastes like milk. I remember that ad when the guy walked up to the counter and he said, oh, could I please have some milk, please? And the lady behind the counter said, would you like full cream milk? Would you like skim milk? Would you like to have half dollop milk? Would you like to have... And he goes, I just want some milk that tastes like real milk. Now, kids, this milk is going to taste like real milk. I'm for sure that that's what's going to happen. Now, Tantan, put one of your straws in your cup for me. And I want you to take a drink. Drink it out, suck it up. 
Yep, through the straw. There's no egg or anything in it, Munya. It's okay. What is, does it taste like milk? What does it taste like? It doesn't taste like milk. It tastes like something else. But what I want to talk to you as the kids are doing their experiment about these straws, and hopefully you can concentrate on me with a bit of noise behind me, but I want to talk to you about reframing your story and relationships that will give you the specific ability and tools to be able to see positivity even in the hardest situations. I want you to see how God is wanting to transform your mind so that you can see and change your mind to see positives even in hard situations. I'm going to give you three tools. Can you hear me okay? I want to give you three tools to help us to reframe our story in our relationships. Tool number one that we have here is, number one is, I want to encourage you occasionally to thank God for what didn't happen and to thank God for what didn't, uh, sorry, and to thank God for what didn't happen. I'll give you an example for this. Now, there was a 20-year-old girl that said to her, her mum and dad, I've got some really bad news I want to tell you, dad and mum. I need you to sit down. Imagine if you're the parents right now. And then she said to them, let me tell you the whole story, and I want you to just to stay calm, okay? But it's really bad news. I went out to a bar, and I met a guy we went and we drank a bit too much. He came back to my apartment and we did some things we shouldn't have done and I'm embarrassed to say, but now I'm pregnant. Now the good news is that his, his probation will be over in a year and he's gonna start looking for a job and once he's out of rehab and he'll consider marrying me, but, but since we can't afford to get married now, he's just gonna move in right now. And she let that hang there for a moment. And then she said, actually, <laughs> none of that's true. The truth is that I got a D in my economics exam. <laughs> and I just wanted you to know that it could have been a whole lot worse. <laughs> now, there may be some times in your life where, where we should ought to thank God for what didn't happen, that didn't happen in our kids' lives that didn't happen in our workplace, that didn't happen in our home, that didn't happen in our personal uh, uh, experience. I don't know what it might be for you, but maybe you've missed a goal at work and, and you had targeted this for so long that you were gonna get this bonus and you ended up not getting your bonus. Maybe you feel devastated by that and, and you, you need to thank God that it could have been a very different situation, like you, didn't, you don't have a job. But you do, and so you've got to be thankful. And you've got to reframe this situation instead of looking at it as a negative, focusing on the positive. And you can actually see that it's going to be all right. You may crash your car and, and you think, oh, darn, it's going to be expensive and there's going to be insurance hassles and the, the car is going to be off the road for ages and this is the worst thing that could have happened to me. Or you can say, you know what? I'm so thankful, God, that nobody got hurt. Thank God that this wasn't actually a big deal. In the whole schemes of things, there are so many things that could have gone wrong, so many things that could have been a bigger deal, and I'm so grateful that although I don't have a car now, I am safe and everyone is well. There are some things that are a big deal, but so often the things that come into our head that we can't get rid of aren't actually such a big deal. And if you'll take a step back every now and then and look with a broader perspective instead of focusing on what you hate, you may just change the frame and say, God, I thank you for what didn't happen. Let me share another example with you that might be a little bit closer to home. We come to church, we enjoy the service, we go out for morning tea, and by the time we get there, the kids have eaten all the biscuits it's horrible, and we should be making a fuss about it. But then we realize and we think about it, what could be the opposite, that we don't have any kids in our church, that there aren't kids causing these sort of problems, and we're actually a church that's got no kids, and if there's a church with no kids, there's no future. 
And so we have to come and say, thank you, God, that there are no biscuits, because the alternative is that there's no kids. We need to reframe how we think, and we need to consider how we should actually be saying thank you to God and encourage our will to be thankful for situations. Number two, the second thing that you can do is practice what we call pre-framing. Pre-framing is deciding how you're going to frame a situation before it happens. I don't know about you, but I've been in a situation where I've been going to a place or I've been going to a meeting. Actually, for me, it's been going to a, a family lunch. And I've got out of my house, I've got into the car and I just sat there and I looked out of, over the steering wheel and I went, this is going to be the most boring family lunch that I've ever experienced. Has anybody else experienced that? <laughs> Millie. <laughs> when did you sit in the driver's seat looking over the steering wheel? <laughs> <Anyway>. <laughs> And the fact of the matter is, is as we're going to that luncheon, I'd already chosen how I was going to perceive this family event. And when I got there, I made it come true because I already decided how the outcome was going to be. However, I could have turned around and said, you know, I love my family. And although I don't like the boring things that my family talks about that has, I have no interest in, I love them and I want to hear about their lives. And for that reason, I'm so grateful that I get to go to this family luncheon. Maybe there's a different situation. Maybe it's your workplace that you're going to work going, I hate going to work. I don't like my people that I work with. But rather you can reframe it and realize, hang on, it's an honor and it's a joy and it's a privilege for us to have a job where we're able to earn income to be able to live off. And so I'm great, so grateful and I'm going, to, I'm going to live out that situation. Maybe you come home and step on Lego or a Barbie doll. Or you come like me home and you see that the puppy has chewed up half your garden. And you can either get really cranky at the situation or you can go from the other side and say, I'm so thankful that I've got children. Or maybe I'm so thankful that I've got a husband that keeps chewing up the garden. Or whatever the situation is, we need to pre frame our situation so that we are prepared to see the positive, prepared to see the good, rather than seeing and perceiving the negative before it happens. And the last point that I want to share with you is that we are to look for God's goodness. You can look for God's goodness because I promise you, you will always find what you're looking for. If you're looking for negativity, if you're looking for something to go wrong that you can be angry at, you're going to find it. Or you can look for the positive goodness that God is bringing into your situation, into your life. And I encourage you to look for God's goodness. If you look for bad, you'll find bad. If you want to see what's wrong with every single day, you'll find with what's wrong with every single day. I want you to look for the good. I want you to look for the best. If you want to see what's wrong, what's bad, what's not working, what's wrong with the world, you can live a really depressed life and a negative life. But instead, if you want to see and the goodness of God working, then you can see it. Because God's goodness, God's blessing is always in your life. But unless you're willing to see God's goodness and God's blessing, you won't see it. If you want to be a person who's blessed by God, open your eyes and look for the things that God is blessing you with. That's how you defeat the negative thoughts. If you're going to say, I'm going to be in this bad situation and God, you need to get me out of that, then you've already started the step of seeing the negative. But rather, God, I know you've put me here and I can't see the goodness, but I want to see your goodness. Show it to me. Let the Holy Spirit reveal it in my life. And I promise you, God will show up. He will reveal that goodness. This is why Paul says in Colossians, pray that in every season, I will have the opportunity to share the gospel that the doors will be open to me. You should be praying that God will open the doors to be able to see the blessing in your life so that you can praise him in every situation. Now, I came to that COVID 2020 situation and I realized that I needed to change my filter. I realized that I needed to see my life and my situation from a different lens. 
And so I started looking for the positivities in my life. And my positivity started small. I realized that God gave me an opportunity to appreciate the small things like my yummy mummy who cooks me food, which is so good. And I, I'm not blaming her for this, but since we've moved here, either the hot water in our washing machine or my wife's beautiful cooking, I don't know which one it is, but I think my clothes are shrinking. It's the hot water of the washing machine. <laughs> and I'm sure of it. But I learned to appreciate the small things that were in front of me. Linda and I got to spend a beautiful time finishing a cubby house for the girls, and Linda painted the cubby house so the kids could play in it. We got to enjoy these special moments. Linda and I got remarried. And then I also got to be married to both of my daughters, where they both got to be the pastors that married me off to their sister. And then our dog down the bottom wanted to join in, so she became a bridesmaid. And we got to enjoy these special moments. We had Millie, she started watching Dora the Explorer and so she started putting her backpack on and and we went out on adventures out to the park, just her and I. We found some pretty amazing things and a dead possum, but pretty amazing things on our Dora Explorer um, experiences. And also we bought two bikes for the girls and they learned how to ride their bikes. These were special moments. Now, as I look back at COVID 2020 lockdowns, I don't look at them from a negative, horrible situation, but I see all the goodness that I can say, God, I'm so thankful for the things that I got to be a part of because of the situation that I was in. What are the negative things that you're a part of? What are the things that are holding you back, that are strongholds in your life that you actually need to change your focus, change your lens, drink your mag out of a different straw? And see the goodness, the sweetness, and the greatness of what God is placing you in. Let us be people that see the goodness of God in our situations. Let us be people that aren't putting on negative thoughts, but let us destroy these negative thoughts by saying, thank you, God, that I'm here right now. And show me the goodness of what you're wanting me to be a part of. So, Father, we ask today by your power and your spirit, that you would help us reframe some things going in in our lives right now. God, renew our mind, any area. God, we're filled with stuff. We're confused, we're hurting, we're disappointed, we're afraid, but God, help us to see you in the situation. I know there are real significant burdens that people are facing right now, real significant burdens, and God, even in the middle of these trials, I pray that we could experience your grace that sustains us, your strength that carries us, and your spirit, God, that comforts us. Help us to see you even when the hurting, even when we're hurting. God, give us the power to see your goodness, to sense your presence, and to do your will. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, before we play one more song, I've got one more video to show you, and then we're going to have our last song um, for the service. No, we're not. (laughs) Ben's up the back going, what video? (laughs) Um, Now, Sophie's not here with us today, which is is okay. Um, But we're going to sing a song. Now, kids, I would love for you to hop up on stage now. Um, And you may not know this song, and that's okay, because what we're going to do in this song is we as grown-ups are going to stand up and we're going to see God's blessing and God's goodness as we look at these children. And we're going to sing the song, The Blessing. And we're going to sing this song as an appreciation and say we're going to bless these children and we're going to sing this song as a blessing to them as we sing a greatness of who God is as well. So will you stand with me as we sing this song together and have a focus of praying this blessing over our children as we sing it.
Just in case you get uh, bored by singing the word amen a little bit in this song, um, let's reframe that. And Phil, did you hear that? I used the word. Where is he? Let's reframe it. And, and every time you hear the word amen, pray for one of these kids. Use the words that we've just sung. Use your own words. If you get sick and tired of praying for these kids, then pray for your own kids, no matter how old they are. Father God, we pray for every little child here among us, and we pray, Lord, for all the big children as well. Father, that you would fill us to overflowing with the power of your Holy Spirit, that you would have your way among us, that you would show us in our minds what is true, lovely, beautiful, noble, good, admirable, and help us to think on these things so that we would have a transformation and the renewal of our minds. Bless these little souls, dear God. May they be found in your house all the days of their lives. For we ask it in the most wonderful and precious name of Jesus, our Lord and Saviour. Amen. Hi, my name is Abby. And thank you so much for joining us this service. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. We'd love to invite you out to join us for morning tea where you can come and tell us how much you appreciate us while we eat all the biscuits. <laughs> but first, let me close this time in prayer. Dear God, we thank you for family and we thank you for this church family. Kids, parents, grandparents, and all the people that fill those roles in the church. Lord, help us not to dwell on negative thoughts, but see the good in each situation. Help us to feel your love 
and to love others how you love us. Help us to share the good news of Jesus with others and bless the fellowship that we are going to have at morning tea. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Uh, Lisa has one more message for us that we didn't get to before. The 19th annual Bundaberg Ecumenical Luncheon is on uh, next, uh, not next Saturday, the Saturday after. Am I getting my dates right? The Saturday the 10th uh, of September at the RSL Club on Key Street. Doors open at 10. Uh, proceeds go to the chaplaincy committee. And Lisa's waving like mad up the back. If you'd like to have any more information about that, go see Lisa after the service. Amen. Yes. Enjoy your morning tea. Be quick before the kids get there. Encouraging in my social distancing space, but I'll allow it. Huh. 